Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started here. It's my uh, pleasure today to introduce uh, Hai Zhou Lu. Uh, Hai Zhou is at the uh, Associate Professor at the University of California, Riverside. And their building is kind of an inverse to ours. All of the labs are above ground and have glass windows. And the hallways are actually outside to go between the labs. And so, <laughs> so uh, Hai Zhou did his uh, PhD at the University of Washington and then a postdoc at UC Berkeley, mm -hmm. and then just continued to move down the West Coast and went to UC Riverside. And he's been there uh, six years, six years so he just recently got tenure. And he uh, does lots of interesting work in drinking water. And so I'll turn it over to Hai Zhou and look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bill, for the uh, introduction and the invitation. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and to be, uh, it's my first time to be in Minnesota and be in this winter wonderland and see all the snow. Um, and, you know, I'm from you know, uh, Riverside, California, which uh, is part of uh, UC Riverside, it's part of the UC uh, systems. We have 10 campuses at Riverside. This is what it looks like now uh, in the wintertime. And we have snow, you can see snow in the peaks of the mountains in the Palm Spring area, it's about one hour drive. But within one hour drive, you can also get to the coast. Um, so my group's research um, has been focusing on um, application understanding of uh, water chemistry uh, redox processes and surface chemistry, electrochemical process, and apply them to a range of environmental uh, treatment and development technologies. So uh, we are very interested in water reuse and desalination. Uh, that will be the topic for today, and specifically we'll talk about the chloramine photolysis for this application. Um, but beyond that, uh, my other group, my other research topics include stormwater management, uh, drinking water distribution systems, um, metals and nutrient management, um, concentrated management from, from inland desalination, uh, etc. And then this project has been funded by a range of federal, state, and industrial grants. So today, uh, my topic is related to uh, photochemical treatment processes uh, to um, get water from alternative sources, especially from municipal wastewater. So this is a process known as potable reuse. We want to convert uh, municipal wastewater to drinking water again. So what's the motivation? So if we take a look at the um, population growth predictions in the U.S. in the next 30 years, right, so a lot of the growth happens in uh, arid southwest regions. You know, Minnesota is also growing. Right, um, and a lot of this growth is in uh, water um, droughts and shortage areas. Um, if we take a look at the uh, U.S. Uh, population growth versus uh, water uh, footprint, so we will have population growth um, continue to increase. Uh, and in terms of the water use, um, historically, you know, from 1950s all the way to 1980s, we have uh, increase of water use. A large part of it is due to we have um, built dams, we have um, extract natural you know, surface water or groundwater sources. But since uh, 1970s, then per capita use of water has been decreasing. Um, that also leads to total water use decrease. But looking to the future, you know, if we assume that uh, we have pretty much um, exhaust or reach a um, uh, saturation point of the natural water resources, we can say that um, in terms of total water use, it will stay pretty flat. Right? And then in order to keep track of uh, keeping pace with the total, total water use in a flat trend um, to combat the population growth that requires uh, a further decrease of per capita water use. So uh, let's just um, assume, give an assumption about these scenarios. And then what happens is, uh, in, my, in my opinion, I think uh, water reuse um, to basically extract or recover wastewater into drinking water again, then it will be a promising strategy right, to keep decreasing the per capita water use and keep the total water uh, budget constant. And if we do a simple calculation, uh, this will correspond to about uh, 700 um, to 400 gallons per capita per day of decrease. And then that will require a reduction of about 42 uh, a billion gallons per day of water use in the U.S. So what does that mean? So if you take, like, take a look at the future predictions, right? so in, on the year 2050, if we want to have about this much of uh, water 
from reuse or reclamation, and what, where we are right now. Right? So currently, uh, in terms of uh, the amount of municipal waste water, uh, we have about 32 um, billion gallons per day of waste water discharge. About 12 of 12 billion gallons per day is in coastal regions. And these waste water, water after traditional biological treatment processes, secondary or tertiary effluent, are directly discharged into the ocean. And if we can take advantage of these waste water discharge and then do further reuse treatment and convert them into <laughs> drinking water again, right, that means that we can recover, it's assumed, 100% of this water. And for waste water discharge in the inland area, about 20 billion gallons per day, uh, let's say if we recover one third of them, which is a very typical number in a lot of cities nowadays, talking about water portfolio, one third of the water comes from recycling and municipal wastewater reuse, that will give us about like 19 um, billion gallons per day. Right? So out of them 42 uh, BGD, then we almost have 40% of the water budget. Right? So if we can reuse, have the portable reuse, that can be a very promising strategy you know, to combat the drought and mitigate the climate change um, effects. Let's take a look at an example in Southern California. So um, in Southern California, uh, if you look at the uh, Los Angeles regions, uh, the water right now is mainly from three sources. Uh, we get the fresh water from uh, the Sacramento, the, the Delta regions, um, through this uh, aqueduct and pipeline. Um, and then we also get water from the Sierra Nevada mountains, from the snow melt. And then one third of the water from Colorado River. Um, and this um, transport of surface water causes, has a lot of energy demand. So if you take a look at the elevation from Northern California to Southern California, it's over 600 miles. And then it needs to overcome about 2,000 to uh, 4,000 uh, feet of elevation for this uh, water transport. That costs a lot of energy. Right? However, if we do portable reuse and use water in, a, uh, in localized um, um, scenarios, then it can save a lot of energy and also the cost. So what are the uh, portable treatment, portable reuse in terms of treatment trim process? So let's say we have um, traditionally treated wastewater effluent. These are secondary uh, effluent. And then typically they will undergo a sequence of unit proce processes. First from, by microfiltration. This is a process to remove particles um, and colloids. Um, and then reverse osmosis to remove dissolved species, salt, and then you know, large molecule organics. Um, and then last step is uh, UV ultraviolet based advanced oxidation process. Right. The industrial standard uh, practice is to add a photosensitizer. Um, in a lot of cases, we're adding hydrogen peroxide. And then upon UV irradiation, it is excited into hydroxyl radical. And these highly oxidative uh, radicals will basically blast away whatever uh, remaining trace organics from the system. And then that uh, leads to the production of highly purified recycled water. However, in terms of chemistry of this whole process, there are a lot of caveats and also rooms for improvement and optimization. Uh, a very important part of the membrane treatment <coughs> is to combat bi membrane biofouling. So because we have residual organics in wastewater effluent, that leads to formation of biofilm. Right, to remove the biofilm, we need to add and prevent biofilm formation and increase the flux of permeate. We typically add disinfectant to control biofilm growth. And in this case, we are taking advantage of the residual ammonia in secondary wastewater. So typically, there's about you know, two to three, four milligram per liter of Ammonia, and then we add um, free chlorine um, prior to in the feed water prior to the membrane treatment. And the idea is, upon reaction with ammonia, then we generate chloramines. So we can generate monochloramine and dichloramine depending on the depending on the pH. Typically, the feed water of uh, secondary wastewater effluent pH is circumneutral. 
77.5 range. Um, the reason why we use chloramine instead of free chlorine is that <coughs> those membrane materials are made of polymers. So chlorine can destroy the polymeric structure, whereas using chloramines, it's a much gentle disinfectant and um, it can preserve the membrane integrity. However, uh, chloramines, they are a group of compounds that are uh, relatively small in molecular size and also neutral. So these compounds are not well removed by even reverse osmosis membranes because one of the removal mechanism about RO membranes is through diffusion. So if this these molecules are neutral, um, they can have steric interactions with the membrane materials and diffuse through the membranes. So typically we will observe about 50 to 70 percent of the chloramines passing through the RO membrane and ended up into the permeate. So now it, there is a very interesting question. Right? So traditionally we have been thinking about our permeate as super clean, right? chemical free um, water matrix. And think about adding hydrogen peroxide uh, is the way to go in terms of UV advanced oxidation process. However, chloramines can ha also have photochemical activities. Now the question is, can we take advantage of this carryover chemical and optimize and design next generation uh, UV AOP treatment, uh, that which will be a critical, critical and then also the last step in terms of removing the trace organics, um, contaminants from uh, re recycled water. So what are the group of co uh, contaminants of concerns in this reuse scenario? So I assume that all of us have heard of pharmaceuticals um, emerging uh, chemical, uh, chemicals of emerging concerns, right? Um, and, and in water reuse scenarios, a lot of these compounds are typically removed by RO membranes because, uh, for example, a lot of pharmaceuticals about or antibiotics compounds, they are um, polar. Uh, they are pro deprotonated, typically in this neutral pH range. Um, and then, uh, so they can be rejected and end up in the concentrate. So the group of compounds that are relevant uh, in our permeate are typically compounds that are poorly rejected by RO. Right? And right now, there is very limited information regarding their fate and their activities in the UV treatment process. These are some uh, um, large-scale engineering ap real applications um, right now in different places across U.S. For example, in this particular case, in Orange County, Southern California, uh, they have implemented uh, this treatment trim process of uh, microfiltration, reverse osmosis, plus uh, UV uh, advanced oxidation process to generate recycled water. Um, and then there is a plan to even expand more. Right? So there's a lot of lead to think about how can we optimize the UVLP process to lower the energy cost as well as producing higher quality recycled water. So um, I'm an environmental chemist in training, so I'm thinking about all these engineering questions. I want to think about from a more fundamental chemical point of view. So if, if we talk about uh, photolysis reactions, the first thing I want to look at is are these compounds, any of these compounds can absorb photons right, and then at which wavelengths. So if we compare, um, this black curve shows monochloramine and then this uh, green curve shows dichloramine. So they're all chloramine species. Compared to the traditionally used hydrogen peroxide, uh, we can see very clear that at the typical uh, UV lamp, uh, single wavelengths that we are currently using, 254 nanometer, uh, the absorption uh, extinct coefficient um, of chloramines is much higher compared to hydrogen peroxide. And then uh, recent years, there has also been a lot of interest in uh, other sulfur-based photooxidants, for example, persulfate. Um, as we can see that the chloramines has an advantage in terms of absorbing, absorbing of photons. Um, and then in terms of uh, in the contaminants, organic contaminants that are relevant for portable radio scenarios, um, I think we need to more pay attention to uh, what is relevant to portable radio scenarios, specifically compounds that can pass through our membranes and also widely occur in uh, wastewater uh, effluent and a compound that have toxicity effects or human health risks effects. 
and also uh, re uh, from a regulatory perspective, the component have fallen into the radar of future regulations. So with these considerations, we think that a group of compounds which are called low <coughs> molecular weight and neutral compounds are very important uh, to investigate. This group of compounds include dioxins, um, alcohol or uh, ketone, uh, functional group containing compounds, chlorinated solvent. Uh, they are quite ubiquitously used in different industrial and um, municipal um, pur for purposes and ended up in trace levels in wastewater effluent and then passing through RO. For example, one for dioxin, um, acetone or uh, chlorinated solvent, the TCE, this is a compound that can readily seep through our membranes. Um, other compounds that need to be considered include compounds that can be indicative of membrane integrity or performances. Um, in some cases, uh, membrane, let's say if membrane uh, module is broken, then those larger molecules can have the chance to seep <coughs> through. Right? So in those cases, we want to choose compounds that can be ubiquitously present in wastewater, but also large, large enough to passing through um, membranes um, during these uh, broken um, scenarios. So we think that a compound that uh, includes uh, caffeine, atenol, or DEET, these uh, pharmaceutical, but towards a low molecular weight uh, um, spectrum are relevant. Uh, uh, caffeine and atenol, these are uh, highly uh, most among the most frequently detected uh, trace organics in wastewater. And DEET is a pesticide that has been widely used for um, residential purposes. Okay. So our research hypothesis is that can we use chloramine as a chemical wizard, uh, wizard to assess and harness its photochemistry for uh, reuse purposes. So there are different hypotheses or fundamental questions which are trying to answer. Uh, includes what are the relevant uh, reactive radical species. If you're working with in photochemical uh, processes, we want to know what are the driving oxidants. Right? And then what's the effects of coexisting with other uh, photooxidants. For example, hydrogen peroxide. Right? And also what are the, how can we control the solution chemical conditions? In this particular case, how can we control, uh, for example, chloride level in our permit right, in order to maximize the treatment efficiency. Right. And then in your know, scaling up uh, process for engineering applications, uh, this fundamental question will lead us to answer the question of you know, what, what photooxidant should we choose? Chloramines or hydrogen peroxide or something else? Right. Um, for example, persulfate or free chlorine, these, these are compounds that have been discussed quite um, widely in recent years. And then what are the indicator compounds that should be uh, really used to predict the um, performances of UVLP process? Also, what would be the degradation pathways of the compound and what's the toxicity? So in order to investigate these research questions, uh, we designed a both bench scale and the pilot scale investigations. Uh, bench scale studies can help us understand very fundamental research questions. And the more pilot scale design can help us validate um, the technologies that we are proposing. So from a, a bench scale setup, uh, we're using very classic way of uh, photochemical investigation where you have a uh, basically a merry-go-round reactor with a UV lamp sitting in the middle and then quartz tubes ser serving as sacrificial reactors. Uh, and then uh, we can follow the reaction kinetics over time. So our first question is, what happens with chloramine photolysis? In this case, monochloramine photolysis. So if we take a look at, if we take a look at chloramine molecule, it had this nitrogen chlorine bond. And you, under UV irradiation, uh, this nitrogen chlorine bond can be broken, which in turn generates two radicals. One is called the NH2 dot, known as amino radical. Other one is chlorine atom, CO dot. So each of this molecule has an unpaired electron, which is very restless. It tries to react with other molecules to grab electrons. And based on literature, um, the amino radical is relatively inactive. So um, this focus on the fate of chlorine dot. So chlorine dot is known to be uh, highly reactive uh, in water. 
And what happens is it can be readily transformed into a secondary reactive species. For example, uh, in the presence of residual amount of chloride, um, chlorine atom can further transform into uh, what is called chlorine dimer, Cl2 dot minus. Um, and then it can also hydrolyze uh, reacting with water, but this is a much minor uh, reaction pathway. But what happens is the chlorine dimer will react with one for dioxin. If we take one for dioxin as a model compound, um, at the same time, chlorine dimer also reacts with this mother compound. So there is some scavenging reactions occurring. And then this chlorine dimer can further hydrolyze and dissociate and eventually leads into the formation of a hydroxyl radical. Right? So in, in essentially, what we are observing is that uh, we are generating uh, two very important reactive species, chlorine dimer and the hydroxyl radical from chloramine photolysis. Right? At the same time, we are taking advantage of its high absorption coefficient, its high um, uh, distinction, distinction coefficient of chloramine. Uh, for dichloramine, very similar photochemistry can take place. Uh, you generate a uh, chlorine atom and then generate this um, uh, amino radicals, um, which is not, known not to be very reactive. And typically, these uh, um, nitrogen-containing radicals uh, will react with dissolved oxygen and leads into ammonia formation. So in order to prove that chloramine photolysis is beneficial for trees organic degradation, uh, we first run an experiment uh, where we vary the amount of the dosage of chloramine in the system, and then we measure the rate of 1,4-dioxane degradation. Right. So the x-axis, the y-axis on the left shows the, uh, this is UV fluence normalized rate. So it's like a surface, surface area normalized rate constant. Right. So it first increased, then decreased, which is very typical uh, in that uh, the first increase because Higher dosage of elicial mother compound leads to more formation of oxidant. Uh, later on, when we, oh, when we go beyond this tipping point, then the scavenging reaction of the mother compound with radicals uh, become predominant and leads to um, a trade-off and lowering the efficiency. Uh, if you take a look at the rate of chloramine photolysis, they always increase. Right? Increase due to photolysis and later on increase more driven by scavenging reactions. And then if we take a look at um, the photolysis of both mono and, mono and dichloramines, uh, their behavior are very similar. Right? So regardless of mono or di, their uh, photoreactivity are quite similar to each other. So in subsequent studies, uh, we used monochloramine as the uh, uh, surrogate to represent the whole chloramine uh, speciation as approximation. So these lowering of reactivities is driven by this, um, these two scavenging reactions, especially uh, this one where uh, chloramines can react with hydroxyl radical. So it does has the benefit uh, in terms of chloramine photolysis to increase the reaction rates, right? but at the same time we need to pay attention to the scavenging reactions. Right? To further quantify the rate of oxidation, what we are doing is we develop a competitive, competitive kinetics model where we use different probe compounds. Um, each of them can um, have different reactivities with certain radicals. And then we de uh, develop this uh, um, intrinsic first order, uh, second order rate, uh, rate expression and solve what's the steady state concentration of each of the uh, three radicals. And then as expected, each of those probe compounds will behave like a pseudo first order reaction kinetics. And based on slope, we can find out what's their steady state concentration. For example, hydroxyl radical, which is one of the most reactive radical, is steady state, steady state concentration is lowest right? because it does not tend to accumulate once it's react, once it's generated, it reacts with um, other things and keep its steady state concentration low. But this approach can help us to quantify the distributions of reactive species. So in this case, we observe that for chloramine photolysis, roughly speaking, about 70% of the hydroxyl radical, of the uh, degradation of 1,4-dioxane is driven by hydroxyl radical uh, 
formation. And about 30% is driven by chlorine dimer formation. So with this fundamental understanding of radical distribution and photolysis reactions, the next step is to scale it up and design a pilot reactor so that we can determine conditions at which we can use chloramines to reach the goal of trace organic degradation. So uh, we are fortunate to have collaborations with water utilities in Southern California, which are very keen in water reuse issues. In this case, we are, are collaborating with Orange County Water District, where we use their uh, real-time RO permeate, right, produced real-time from the large-scale treatment, and divert them into a holding tank. And then we use um, basically a flow-through reactor, um, which simulates the typical hydraulic retention time of a large-scale system, about 30 seconds. And then we add different indicator compounds, uh, contaminants, and then different photooxidants, right? um, and then we use um, chloramines or hydrogen peroxide, and then observe what's the removal um, um, rate or kinetics of contaminant degradation. So this is a schematic, this is a picture of what the pilot scale system look like. We have a holding tank, and then this is this this is a flow through a UV reactor where we have a you know, long uh, UV lamp sitting in the middle and it's sealed. And it's quite an experience for my students and postdoc like to get, tr get interactions with engineers uh, at this you know, full-scale treatment plant and then design your know, pilot-scale treatment. Uh, um, uh, it's quite um, an interesting journey, uh, and we are enjoying it. So let me show you some of the pilot-scale um, results. So here I'm going to switch the units in the uh, x-axis. So earlier, all the bench-scale results I have shown the concentration of chloramines are in minimal. So it's about 100 times higher uh, than the concentration I'm showing here because we need to use, uh, it's relevant to use higher concentration to get a better understanding about reaction kinetics. But here, during the pilot, we lower the chloramine concentrations to more uh, relevant to real-scale ap applications. So typically, chloramines is between uh, 0 to 10 milligram per liter at most. And then what we observed is that um, they say, first we look at um, acetone. Uh, acetone removal is quite inefficient by chloramine photolysis. Uh, one of the major reasons is acetone has very low reactivity with hydroxyl radical. Um, and then if we look at one for dioxin, um, TCE, and DEET, caffeine, artenanol. Right? So all of these compounds give us a uh, trend that is very similar to bench scale reactions, where we have increased first, then kind of stabilized or slightly decreased. Right. So from this uh, pilot scale investigation, so typically we need to maintain a chloramine level about two to three milligram per liter to reach a desirable uh, log removal. Right. So here I express everything as log removal. This is basically um, proportional to the reaction rate constant, the second or first uh, second order rate constant. So what this tells us in terms of engineering implication is that uh, instead of using hydrogen peroxide uh, as the um, default industrial standard, what we can do is we can eliminate it. Uh, if we eliminate it and just use chloramine photolysis, it can give us some extent of removal. But for some compounds, for example, 1,4-dioxin, the log removal is about 0.2. Uh, so in California, there is a requirement from the regulation that it leads to reach 0.5 log removal. So in order to increase log removal, what we can do is we can increase the UV intensity, right? Ad let adding higher intensity UV lamps, right? and potentially can lead to um, the um, requirement, meeting the requirement of photolysis. So if we take a look at the results where we vary the UV fluence in the pilot scale reactions from about 900 millijoule per square centimeter to about 1,200, so it's about like 20, 30 percent increase. What we observe is that we, we see an increase of log removal of uh, one for dioxin. And then for other compounds, um, and so we did a calculation where if we want to make sure that they say one for dioxin in this particular case uh, um, have this amount of uh, 0.5 log removal, what it means that we need to increase 
the UV intensity to about 3,000 millijoule per square centimeter. Right? And for other compounds, they can reach one logo removal with much lower uh, UV uh, intensity. So using higher UV dosage and completely eliminate hydrogen peroxide, that's uh, number one, uh, strategy number one right, to help optimize the system. And the second strategy we're looking at is they say if we cannot avoid, if we want to use hydrogen peroxide, right, or in the system that majority of the water reuse uh, facilities are using hydrogen peroxide as the default photooxidant, what happens? Right, how can we control the balance, the relative ratio between chloramines versus hydrogen peroxide to maintain that high extent of removal? So from a fundamental level, if we have hydrogen peroxide photolysis coexisting with chloramines, what happens is it generates additional hydroxyl radical. In theory, it should make the reaction better. So if we do a model calculation based on a theoretical quantum yield and extinction coefficient, we should observe an increase of reactivity as we increase the chloramine dosage when we keep hydrogen peroxide constant. However, in reality, what we observe is that uh, the rate of uh, contaminant degradation is decreasing uh, with more um, chloramine coexisting with hydrogen peroxide. Right? So this difference between the theoretical prediction and experimental observation indicates there are very strong scavenging uh, reactions. Uh, we then we test this in a pilot scale system. Right? So what happens when chloramines are coexisting with hydrogen peroxide? So we've, we've seen uh, the data of 1,4-dioxane without hydrogen peroxide. Right? So the local removal maximum is about 0.2. And then this, in this case, we have further uh, um, divide the contribution uh, into contribution from this uh, darker color uh, shows contribution from hydroxyl radical. And this lighter color shows contribution from chlorine, and di uh, chlorine dimer, CO2 dot uh, minus. So as we increase chloramine concentration, um, the hydroxyl radical uh, uh, dis di uh, dis uh, contribution also decreased. But if we start to add um, hydrogen peroxide into the system, so in this case, we're adding 2.5 milligram per liter of hydrogen peroxide. Right? What happens is, if we're using hydrogen peroxide, then have chloramine around is very detrimental. Because formation, uh, existence of chloramines will reduce the log removal efficiency. And this reduction uh, is also observed when we increase hydrogen peroxide concentration to 5 milligram per liter. So what happens here is that when we have uh, molar chloramine added in, co in coexistence with uh, hydrogen peroxide, what happens is uh, we have uh, the scavenging of hydroxyl radical um, by um, monochloramine. Right? So the contribution of hydroxyl radical decreased initially. Right? And then later on with mo monochloramine, we have an increase of chlorine dimer, but the rate of chloramine dimer increase cannot compete against the scavenging of hydrogen peroxide. That leads to this decrease of reac reactivity. Right? So basically, it's all uh, related to this reaction here. Uh, it's a competition of reaction number nine versus uh, number 10 and number four. So if we further plot uh, the percentage or the fraction, fraction of hydroxyl radical scavenging by monochloramine, right? so this um, scavenging trend uh, basically mirror image, they have inverse correlation with the rate of 1,4-dioxane removal. And then that's correspond to decrease of hydroxyl radical steady state and increase of chlorine um, dimer. So what does this mean in terms of engineering implications? So if we take a look at uh, the current um, status quo, if we want to, if for utility, then want to keep using hydrogen peroxide and avoid increasing the UV intensity, right, upgrading their UV lamp intensity, one choice is to remove chloramine. If we remove chloramine to below this 2.5, 2 milligram per liter, then we can minimize hydroxyl radical scavenging. 
So how can we do this in a um, large scale uh, set, uh, setup? One process is to do breakpoint correlation. So we can, what we can do is we can add free chlorine uh, right after the RO uh, into the permit. And the free chlorine will react with chlor chloramines and leads to um, uh, nitrogen gas formation. So we eliminate um, the chloramines and the only leaves uh, hydrogen peroxide uh, if we add them externally. And I think this is also relevant for uh, free chlorine applications. Uh, nowadays, there's, there's a lot of interest in thinking about what additional oxygen should we should use. For example, UV free chlorine. And then if we use UV free chlorine in this case, we would have break point take place. Okay. So we talk about free chlorine. What about other photooxygen we can think about? Okay. One choice is uh, persulfate. Okay. Persulfate has been used in uh, groundwater remediation, um, which generates sulfate radical. And persulfate has the advantage of generating sulfate radical, which is more selective than hydroxyl radical. So if we have persulfate into the system, uh, persulfate have this peroxy bond, which will be broken upon UV radiation and generate sulfur radical. Sulfur radical can react with one for dioxin, or it can also be converted into hydroxyl radical. Right. So we did a proof of concept bench scale investigation uh, where we increase the concentration of chloramines uh, and keep persulfate constant. What is very, this slide is a bit busy, but the take home message is, if you look at the overall trend, it's first there is an increase of overall uh, reactivity before it starts to decrease. Right? So this increase of reactivity speaks to the fact that we can add um, persulfate, which will have synergistic effects in increasing the reacti reactivity of the, uh, uh, of the system by increasing the hydroxyl radical formation. Right? So the reason for that is, Sulfur radical has relatively slower scavenging reaction with um, chloramines, and the majority of sulfur radical generated will be diverted into contaminant degradation or converted to uh, highly reactive radicals. So, so far we've been investigating um, the reaction kinetics of the mother compound degradation. Right? And the, a companion question is, what about byproducts formation? Are we generating undesirable byproducts or even more toxic byproducts? Right. So for byproducts formation, I think there are two groups compounds that are very relevant. Very relevant. The first group is nitrogenous compounds. Right. Because we are using chloramines, we want to minimize any nitrogenous compound formation, especially organic nitrogen compounds. And then these are very, um, this is a prim primitive results uh, we generated so far. But what it shows is that regardless of what other coexisting photooxidant, uh, if we have chloramine photolysis, then we'll have 70% of the product as ammonia, and then some nitrate, and then there is some fraction of organic nitrogen. Um, of course, this data we cannot extrapolate into real world, uh, real world systems because we're using relatively high concentration of chloramines. But what it speaks to is we need to further investigate and pay attention to especially the organic nitrogen formation. For example, we want to prevent uh, nitrosamines and the disinfection byproduct formation. Right. And generating ammonia in the system uh, is undesirable, but we need to take this, this into perspective because if we have only two to three milligram per liter of chloramines, the amount of ammonia generated will be relatively small. The next question about byproducts is, what's the degradation product or oxidation byproduct of these trace organics? Right. Uh, here I showed a slide that lists all the pos possible pathways leading, leading to 1,4-dioxin degradation by different radicals that are relevant to the system. Right. Because we want to prevent any more toxic compounds from formation, so we, we pay particularly attention to aldehyde compounds. So in this case, glycoaldehyde and formaldehyde, uh, these aldehyde ketone-containing um, functional groups, uh, they are known to induce toxicities on DNAs, on cells. Right. So in particular, we look at 
glycodialdehyde and formaldehyde uh, compounds. And then we, what we do is um, we run a comparative study where we compare different UVLP process, processes and then their product generation. What um, jumps out from these graphs are that we observe that aldehyde is almost a universal uh, byproduct in all the three different UVLP processes, which shown in this blue color curve. And then formaldehyde, which is this uh, light green uh, color um, product. Right. So to further understand their to toxicity implications, uh, we designed different in vivo bioassays. Uh, uh, there are two bioassays that we uh, designed. One is to investigate the cell toxicity. Another one is to uh, investigate the uh, genome toxicity, the DNA damages. So this is one to uh, toxicity assay where we use human cancer cells, T cells, and then um, induce different exposures of those byproducts, aldehyde, as well as mother compound one for dioxin. And the idea is uh, these compound, uh, for this particular assay, it will induce uh, a pathway called the P53 pathway, which regulates how uh, DNA uh, you know, responds um, to um, uh, regulate the cell activities. And then the activity will be sh uh, shown in terms of fluorescence responses. Right? So in terms of the uh, cytotoxicity, uh, if we have a dose response curve, we see that this glycoaldehyde jumps out of the curve. A cell viability decreases much faster than the mother compound one for dioxin. Uh, if you look at the cell uh, genotoxicity, uh, higher uh, at the same dosage, uh, glycoaldehyde gives us much higher uh, response. And based on these results, we were able to calculate what will be. Um, the LC50 and the effective dose uh, concentration induce 50% of adverse effects, EC50. Right? So the smaller the number is, the more toxic um, this chemical compound becomes. So uh, di glycodialdehyde, glycoaldehyde uh, has a toxicity level, res toxicological response level that is orders magnitude higher than this mother compound, one for dioxin. Right? So what does this mean? This means that in the future, if we do water reuse, you know, portable reuse, our end target should not only be the log removal of the mother compound degradation, but also the, uh, the uh, toxicological response, the overall toxicological response of the treated water. And it will give us guidance in terms of what's the length, duration of the treatment, and then what's the optimized condition uh, we need to control. So beyond this chemical degradation, story. Uh, a lot of big part about water reuse is pathogen control. Right? We want to minimize any pathogenic bacteria or virus to seep through and end up in the recycled water. So uh, in collaboration with microbiologists, uh, we are also interested in looking into what's the, uh, what are these different photooxidant efficiency on, on inactivation of pathogens. Right? So we talk about hydroxyl radical, we talk about chlorine dimer, and sulfate radical. This process is still ongoing, um, but our preliminary data showed us that if we look at traditionally hydroxyl radical um, inactivation on this E. coli, uh, we use a pathogenic E. coli as a model a microorganism. It has a relatively long induction phase or this lag phase before it starts to decrease right? because the cell has uh, immune uh, systems that come back uh, the oxidative stress. But for sulfate radical, it's very interesting. We have very short amount of induction phase, followed by start to lose of the cell viability. Right. So this short induction phase can have profound implication in terms of point of use treatment. Right. We can start to inactivate uh, pathogenic uh, response very quickly using this uh, alternative oxidant. Okay. So in summary, uh, what I have found is that uh, in terms of chloramine photolysis, um, both molar and dichloramine as carryover chemicals, they generate reactive species, including hydroxyl radical and chlorine dimer and chlorine atom. And then we are currently investigating these different um, photooxidants, including persulfate and free chlorine. 
uh, coexisting with chloramines on their efficiency on uh, our permeate treatment. And for uh, engineering implications, I think in the future, a lot of water utilities need to face the choices of either choosing higher photon energy right, by upgrading their UV intensity, take advantage of chloramine only, and then eliminate hydrogen peroxide, or keep their UV intensity the same by adding extra chemicals to remove chloramines and keep using hydrogen peroxide, or using alternative oxidants such as persulfate. And then in terms of treatment criteria, we need to think carefully about what are the indicator compounds, especially um, neutral hydrophobic no molecular weight and can pass in through our membranes. And then there are toxicity implications, not only just the degradation of mother compound. And I'd like to acknowledge this particular case, funding source from uh, NSF, uh, US Bureau of Recommendation, Water Research Foundation, uh, as well as um, um, the work, hard work from my uh, research group. Um, with that, I'd like to thank you for attention and answering questions. Um, is there a significant economical advantage of increasing the UV intensity versus um, adding specific photo oxidants? Yeah, so uh, to answer that question, we're currently doing some economic calculations right, to find out what would be the cost uh, balance and uh, trade-off. Um, typically, the UVLP process cost com is composed of maintenance costs, uh, equipment cost, and the chemical cost, and the UV energy cost. And we're in the process of calculating the different scenarios um, in, in a large-scale you know, applications. Um, yes, that's, that's the question we need to answer. Since I have the microphone, I'm going to ask one. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned NDMA, mm -hmm. and there's several points in this where you get mm -hmm. NDMA at the initial chloramination, you can probably mm -hmm. get it in the UV system. Mm -hmm. Have you looked at NDMA, or do you think that's going to be a large issue with implementing these uh, kind of oxidation processes? Yeah, so uh, definitely there, the NDMA is an uh, issue that needs to be uh, looked closely. Um, there is NDMA, uh, definitely NDMA formation prior to UV ALP process because there's chloramines plus residual organics. Um, however, NDMA has very strong direct photolysis rates. So if they are formed in the UV ALP process, they will be uh, directly pho photolyzed and degraded. But the question is, after that UV, and if you have residual chloramines and then have residual organics, how to control it. I think there are other research groups looking into this area. One um, idea is to control, have a very close control of the pH in our permeate in acidic versus alkaline pH, which can drive the reactivity of these NDMA precursors. So yes, there are, we need to control it very carefully, and then there are ways to manipulate. I was actually bothered by one of your first slides mm -hmm. where it said the per capita water use was 600 gallons per capita per day. Mm -hmm. um, I know of no city that has 600 gallons being consumed per person per day. So you're using, obviously in those numbers, you're using all sorts of other yes. potential uses in terms of cooling, yeah. uh, potential agricultural mm -hmm. use, et cetera. Um, how does this concept translate uh, if we start doing separation of our, I'm, I'm going to call it our, our waste mm -hmm. streams, mm -hmm. uh, the, the water coming out of a, a, mm -hmm. a, a municipal mm -hmm. uh, water treatment plant is going to mm -hmm. be very different than treating water coming out of an industrial setting? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, good, that's a good question. Yes, that slide, uh, that the numbers are um, I, um, cited from a study that's looking to per capita use of total water use, industrial, agricultural, and municipal adding together. And then, you know, definitely I recognize that this, there are other, if you want to reduce this overall per capita use, uh, equal uh, amount of effort need to be put into industrial water reuse or agricultural sectors. And that's why uh, in the next bar chart, I showed the municipal water reuse, you know, based on this very rough calculation, accounts for about 40% 
of that, eff of that effort. Um, but it's still a significant fraction. Other 60%, if you want to make that water reuse goal, it needs to come from you know, non-portable non -portable, uh, um, um, sectors, uh, irrigation, agriculture reuse, or industrial you know, energy generation, cooling water recycling, for example, like these different processes. Great talk, thank you. Um, so I think one of the overall messages I got was that the chloramines are kind of causing a problem as much as they might be helping. How married are the water treatment mm -hmm. kind of organizations to using the chloramines? I understand they have like a purpose, but it, would it be possible to choose something else that may not cause so many issues? And do you see some resistance from that within talking to the engineers at the plant? Yeah. That's a great question. I think this, there are two sides of it. I think, I think the first, we started this project by thinking about can we promote right, just using chloramines as a single oxidant. And then the results show that it does have effects, but it does not really get where it you know, ideally can be you know, compared to your hydrogen peroxide. So there are other you know, processes, for example, increase UV dosage to boost it up. Right? Or if they, uh, this is from a beneficial point of view. But in other cases, if we want to optimize the treatment uh, efficiency by minimizing chloramine while keep hydrogen peroxide, that can also be achieved. So it's like two options to weigh on. Right? So this is from uh, the engineering optimization point of view. I think from a fundamental science and from a more uh, applicability point of view, I think these studies are also very important for future development of UV-free chlorine systems. Because in a lot of cases, almost ubiquitously, all the wastewater effluent contains some level of ammonia. Right? So let's say if we want to use UV-free chlorine, even as a, just a uh, standard drinking water treatment process, then we will have chloramine formation right, coexisting with uh, free chlorines. So understanding those free, um, chloramine photolysis reactions will also be beneficial for us to estimate what's the true yield of radicals and then what's the uh, actual removal uh, efficiency of the system. Right? So it has both water reuse application optimization as well as uh, adaptability to other system purposes. Okay? But I think to um, uh, cho choose the engineering optimization options, we need to combine the treatment toxicity and the cost all together to reach the final decision. Okay, let's thank Hai Thank you.